came on. Zach, would you make Miss Rose Crook uh, co-host, please? And this is Russell. Hey, I'm trying to log on, and when I open my uh, Prime Gov, it takes them to an agenda. But I can't seem to go past the agenda. What's the next step, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Pace. Uh, when I open my Prime Gov, it takes me to a live meeting agenda of our meeting, but I can't seem to negotiate navigate from there well it shows that you're connected sir do you see the the items on the agenda on the left side of your page that's all i have is the items of the agenda yes sir that's that's what you're supposed to see sir oh good <laughs> all right chair crook are you okay i don't see you in prime gov yet I'm, I'm working on Prime Gov. I am here, but I'm working on Prime Gov. So my apologies. Okay, thank you. You know, I'll just comment. I'm on the airport trust, and every month when we have a Zoom meeting, I have I start from scratch as far as knowledge of how to deal with all this, <laughs> like Prime Gov. <laughs> it's a struggle every you're, month. You're not alone, Kirk. I went to Prime Gov this morning and clicked and and it came up live meeting or whatever the other one was and I thought oh no I don't think that's right had to go back to the instructions to look I had this panic like uh, uh oh I'm going to be late for the meeting but everything's yeah. okay now we want you in live meeting that's great <laughs> yes I'm yeah I got it I just had to find the instructions and make sure it was right yeah well, so it's telling me to um, to resend my email confirmation. It's acting like it doesn't like me anymore. So Jennifer or Alan, can you assist the chair? Uh, yes, this is Jennifer. I'm here. So it looks like your email to sign in is teresa.rosecrook at okc.gov? Correct. And that's what you're trying? Correct. And the error message is saying it's not verified? Well, it's telling me to resend my email confirmation. Hmm. Can I make sure that you're at the right spot for logging in? Absolutely. You want to be at okc.primegov dot com forward slash login okay let me try all of that again without the forward slash login it looks like you're in the right spot but it's very deceivingly not right um so mark do we want to go ahead and let me run the meeting um and let me get signed in to uh prime gov i hate to hold everybody up because i know we have a full agenda today yes um we can do uh roll call and okay. um, for votes that you are not signed in at. Right, if you could do that and then um, I can read our statements and we'll get our meeting moving along. All right, thank you. Okay. So Francie, if you'll uh, roll call, please. Well, you'll want to read the statement first. Yes. Okay. I apologize. Okay. Um, so thank you for joining us today for the MAPS for Citizens Advisory Board meeting um, video conference. Um, we have a few announcements to make, so bear with me. 
If the video conference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio video connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 15 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued uh, at 11.30 a.m. Um, later the, today, uh, September 3rd. Um, the agenda and documents are located on okc.gov. To speak on any agenda item, please call in advance or call right now, 405-297-3468. Uh, or text your request in advance of the meeting or right now uh, to 405-205-4195. Please include your name, the agenda item that you want to speak on, um, and then we'll get back to you. Please submit your request prior to the beginning of the meeting, so right now. Uh, to avoid receiving your request after your item has been considered. City staff will attempt to submit requests received during the meeting to process them to uh, me for your time to speak on the item. Please speak or to speak under comments by board, staff and citizens, please call 405-297 three, four, six, seven, or text to four, zero, five, two, zero, five, four, one, nine, five. Please list your name, address, phone number, and the subject on which you wish to address the board. Thank you. Now, Francie, if you would uh, roll call. We have a quorum. You won't need the roll call. Okay, great. Um, so our first item is uh, to approve minutes of our August 6th board meeting. Do we hear a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, please cast your vote. Ms. Rose Crook, how do you vote? Uh, affirmative. Mr. Stone, Stone Cipher, are you online? I'm online, I vote yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shen, are you in yet? It passes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, the next item on our agenda is to receive the MAPS for Revenue and Expenditure Report ending August 28th, 2020. Madam Chair, you have the uh, financial report, as you said, ending August 28th, and uh, you can see that it's going well. We've, we've reduced the negative target amount by about four percentage points from last month. So. Um, we're catching up a little bit, still very optimistic. Ask for your approval. Okay. You take a motion to approve the revenue and expenditure report. Okay, I'll we vote. have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, please vote. And Francie, I vote aye. Mark Stone Cyper votes yes. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. The, the report is received and approved. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda, as we started with our last meeting of asking um, former mayors and leaders of MAPS program to kind of give us a little bit of the history of MAPS from their perspective, um, we've asked, or I've asked, um, Mayor Kirk Humphreys to join us this morning and um, share with us kind of his perspective and um, comments about 
the history of maps and the the, the maps for program. Kirk, thank you thank so you, Madam much. Chair. Thank you, you so much for taking time to join us this morning. I know you've got just a few minutes, but I appreciate you you taking a few minutes for us. Delighted to be with you, and I, I'd like to thank all the members for serving. Um, I believe, as you'll tell from my comments, I believe this is one, one of the most important aspects of MAPS. It's part of the secret sauce. Um, every city has needs, um, just an in, in, endless list of needs. Um, that's certainly true of Oklahoma City. We've always been a city with a lot of vision. Uh, for most of our history, we really had the vision and no way to realistically deliver on that vision. Uh, but Ron Norick brought together, I guess, 27 years ago now, he brought together the need and the vision and a structure of integrity. Now, I don't want to imply that previous leaders didn't have integrity. That's not the point. No one, no one put it all together quite like Ron did in 1993. And our city was desperate at the time. I think it's important for current generation and future generations just to remember how bad it was in the 80s. And uh, MAPS was born out of desperation. We, we tried to buy our way to success. And finally, Ron said, why don't we invest in ourselves? And, um, and so he coupled the massive needs with transformational investments. And he put into place something that I don't think we'd ever had before in our city is, is citizen oversight of that process. And that's where you come in um, with MAPS. And I, and I believe that that's really a structure of integrity. With MAPS, for the first time, we not only made promises, but we counted the cost of delivering those promises beforehand. And then we promised what we could deliver, and then we made sure we delivered on those promises. And the voters now have gone back to the polls countless times over the last 27 years and have given us over $2 billion to invest. And you're the stewards of that investment for MAPS 4. Um, but that process demands accountability. And uh, while you're an advisory board, the one thing you have is you have the bully pulpit. And when you speak, the citizens will listen. And so it's very important that, that uh, our elected leaders work with you to be sure that we deliver what we promise to our voters. I, the thing I worry about with MAPS is that if we ever fail to deliver what we promise, we'll lose the voter trust. And you're the guardians of that. You're the ones who are going to work with the elected officials and say, no, we can't do that. And uh, we must deliver what we promised when the voters come. Promise. So it's bringing together need and vision and a structure of integrity. And it has served our, our city very well for almost three decades now. And uh, I just encourage you to be good watchdogs of that process. Thank you for serving. And thank you so much, Mayor. Um, dear friend, appreciate all the, the roles and the investment of your time and effort into our community. And, and thank you for um, helping put some context and remind us of what, what at the end of the day, our big goal is. So you bet. You're, you're valued and appreciated very well, much. Well, likewise, Teresa, good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, again, Kirk, you're welcome to stay. We'd love to, you know, if, if you're interested in hearing about these projects, and um, we've got some interesting ones on our agenda for today. Well, I'd love to stay, but I can't. So thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, take care. You bet. Bye-bye. Great. So, um, so appreciate those that have gone before us and um, kind of laid the, the groundwork. Um, again, so moving on to item five, uh, continuing with our series of presentations on the projects that are included in MAPS 4. Um, today we have with us Tim O'Toole, um, and I'll let him kind of introduce himself with the Oklahoma State Fairgrounds, and he is going to present uh, the information regarding the Coliseum, which is included in as a MAPS 4 project. So. Tim, are you with us? There, I see you. You're muted. There we go. I'm here. Great. Good morning, Teresa. Good morning. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. No, it's it's my pleasure. And I'd like to uh, <clears throat> echo what Kirk Humphrey said. That's as, uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in the MAPS process since uh, December 
1997, I actually was uh, engaged with the completion and the subsequent opening and operation of the Bricktown Ballpark uh, for six and a half years. And then of course here at the fairgrounds and um, the citizens oversight and, and how, how that works has been one of the keys to the success. So um, you all are to be uh, congratulated for the time you're uh, choosing to dedicate to our city. It's, it's very, very admirable for all of us. We're gonna talk about the new Coliseum here at the, at the fairgrounds. Um, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll just go through this presentation and then obviously I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone might have, or if you wanna stop me at any one point, I'm, I'm fine to do that too. So are we ready to go, Teresa? Okay, here we go. Uh, this is it, MAPS 4, it's a Coliseum proposal. Uh, we considered an investment for all. Uh, Carrie, Lisa, thank you. The big house, many people call it the big house. It's where lifelong memories are made, particularly in a high school athletics and youth expo events that have taken place throughout the years. The fairgrounds operation, the 435 acres is owned by the city of Oklahoma City. The company I work for, and, and actually uh, Kirk is a, is a member of our board of directors, is Oklahoma State Fair Inc. We're a 501c3 corporation, probably the oldest 501c3 corporation in the state of Oklahoma. It, the, because there's only two things we do. We operate and own the Oklahoma State Fair in the fall. We also then operate the fairgrounds on behalf of the city of Oklahoma City under a management contract. Uh, so uh, the first state fair was actually in 1906, a year before we had a, an actual state. So that, that's how long the Oklahoma State Fair Inc. has been in existence. So we're governed by a 40 member board of directors. We have a full-time staff that we office here at the fairgrounds and it's our job to manage the property 24-7. Uh, we pay all the operating costs at the fairgrounds with the exception of the water and the wastewater services. Our operating revenue comes from rental fees and et cetera. Um, our role is to create economic development for the city of Oklahoma City through tourism and the operation of the fairgrounds. Um, the Jim Norick Arena is, is a classic building that has done well for the city of Oklahoma City has served our, its purpose as well. Uh, the unfortunate part of it is the average life cycle of a public sport event arena is 30 to 40 years. Uh, this arena is now 55 years old and is nearing the end of its useful life. Uh, Lisa is showing you with, with her arrow there. If you see the concave structure there, those are cement walls that are supported by those lateral wires. It was a very unique, efficient form of construction at the time it was built 55 years ago. That construction, however, is one of the reasons that we have the building is old and deteriorating. That coupled with the columns that support it. All the weight of the building is on the top of the building like an inverted top hat. Um, so we can go to the next slide then. Uh, in 2017, after many types of studies and operations to look at how we could refurbish, rebuild and or replace the arena, the decision was made with city staff, consultation with the city manager, uh, consulting engineers and everything that we needed to start working on a plan to replace the arena on our time frame, not its time frame. As, as you'll see, it's heavily used. It's an integral part of the tourism economy in Oklahoma City. And as far back as 2010, we had identified and corrected various structural issues associated with the structure and had been working for many years to try and come up with an adequate solution. Uh, in late 2016, the structural engineers involved said it was time to focus our energies on what we would do with a new Coliseum. So at that time, um, we started down a path to, to do that. Um, 
As I mentioned, our role is economic development through tourism. You can see there's over 2.1 million visitors come through the fairgrounds every year. 53% of those people are our neighbors. They're from central Oklahoma. 47% of, of the people that come through the fairgrounds are out of town guests. The fairgrounds uh, accounts for over 170,000 annual hotel room nights each year into the Oklahoma City economy. Um, our total, we host over 2,000 event days. An event day is when one building is occupied for one day. So if you take all the buildings and the amount of days that they're occupied, we host over 2,000 event days per year. The direct tax revenue that's estimated off of the fairgrounds is in excess of $13 million a year. That's sales tax revenue that goes direct into the economy. Um, these are some of the many events we, we host it in the Coliseum, in the current Norick Arena and in the new Coliseum Wrestling High School Basketball Championships, the Youth Expo. Uh, what we do a tremendous amount of graduations for local high schools, even for OSU, OKC, several uh, generations have passed through there. The total direct annual spending economic benefit off of the events at the fairgrounds is estimated for the last three years to average 326, over $326 million. That is more than the economic impact of all of the other city venues together if you add them together. The, the fairgrounds is the largest single generator and that's primarily because of all the hotel room nights that are generated. The new Coliseum is estimated to be, well, approximately about 4,000 fixed seats, 2,600 retractable seats, somewhere between 7,300 and 7,500 total seats, depending upon the configuration of the events that are going on at that time. We'll have uh, updated first-class patron amenities, concessions, restrooms, and we'll have a modern wide concourse that you can see all the activity going on in, on the floor at any one time. Um, this is where we are today. The, as you can see, this process started back in 2017. The consultant architect that was hired by the city of Oklahoma City in January in 27 using the city's consultant selection process. Our design plans are approximately 55% complete. Revisions to original plans will be need to be made based on the final maps for funding allocation, which we've already started that process in working with the architect consultants. The consultant fees to date have been paid out of the hotel tax bond funds, city of Oklahoma city money. So the city has already invested in their plans of this new Coliseum, knowing that it's a, it's a long drawn out process. The remainder of the consultant fees will be paid out of the MAPS three excess funds, which have already been approved by the city council. The proposed site is adjacent to the existing Norick Arena. This was critical in our studies on feasibility and where to locate a new facility and that we will be able to build the new Coliseum while not disrupting our existing business. And that, that's very critical. It's estimated that during construction alone, the, uh, pro the construction process will generate around $230 million in direct spending into the Oklahoma City economy. This is an outline of where the new Coliseum will go. And if you see the red, hopefully you can see the red outline there around the connector. That is the existing Norick Arena site. And so the new Coliseum will be built just to what I call the south and the east of the existing arena while we're using the old Norick Arena. Okay, next, Lisa. This is the current funding of where we are. The MAPS for allocation was $63 million. The minimum that will be available from a future issuance of hotel tax bonds will be $25 million. Uh, there are other sources of funds, naming rights, sponsorships, some of the MAPS 3 excess funds that's already been allocated may be available. We estimate that all those sources will, will reach $7 million. 
we believe that the Coliseum under its current configuration, the budget will be $95 million. Um, our competitors, the tourism business, the, particularly the horse show business that we're in, it's a competitive business. Um, Fort Worth just opened a new $540 million, 18,000 seat arena right next to its uh, horse show operations in Fort Worth. Uh, Dallas is doing a master plan study for the potential of 150 to $200 million renovation of uh, their state park in Dallas. Uh, Tulsa has completed a 90 million fairgrounds improvements project over the last several years. In addition to Albuquerque, Denver, and Louisville are our major competitive cities that we uh, particularly compete for the um, equine business. What will happen without a new Coliseum? It, it's always our goal to have long-term contracts, State Fair Inc. That's one of the things we're able to go out and do that the city and others can't do is we make long-term contracts and guarantee the rates for events to come to Oklahoma City. We have a multitude of those contracts. Most of them are three to five, some of them seven years out with our major horse show customers that guarantee the occupancy of our hotel room nights. Um, those things would suffer as, as they are now during the pandemic. Um, but obviously, if the arena were to close under its terms and not our terms, it would not be good for our local business and our sales tax revenue in Oklahoma City. Um, that concludes the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, so I would open it up to uh, any member who has a question of Tim. Hey, Tim, this is Mark Stonecipher. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Hey, Tim, this is Mark Stonecipher. I missed a little of your presentation. I'm so sorry, but could you explain to me what happens to the existing Jim Norick Arena and can you compare the seating capacity between the two facilities? Okay, the, during the construction, the existing arena will stay there. We will start as close as we possibly can to the building and there'll be some alterations that will have to be made for entrances, but the arena itself will stay there. After the new Coliseum is built, the um, Norick Arena will be imploded. That site will then be removed. We will have created a temporary connector to um, show the, to deal with traffic out of the barns into the new arena. And that site will become a connector with a trade show exhibit area. If Lisa, if you wanted to go back to the, to that one slide that has the arena on there. Um, yes, right there. You can see that area that says connector and actually that tan area just above that is actually now under the new plan once the MAPS funding was allocated. That will be an exhibit area there. This capacity of, of the existing Norick Arena today is right at about 9,000, depending upon the event. It's, it's uh, you know, ADA and a lot of different configurations that we've had to make through the years. Uh, this uh, Arena will be a little bit smaller in capacity, but it handles the, the customer that we service here. This is, this is not meant to be a Coliseum that competes with the uh, Chesapeake Arena. Uh, that This is a, a building that is built for the type of events that the fairgrounds host. Thank you, Tim. Um, Bob, did I think that, did, did I hear you you need to, you have a question as well? No, I think Shay does. I did okay. not. Okay, or and Kevin, I think. Yeah, um, hi, Tim. I was just wondering, I know uh, the proposal said it was, uh, this project would be supported by 25 million in hotel taxes. And I just wondered um, if COVID oh. has had an on those estimations. It has had an impact on the collections just like it has on the sales tax collections 
it hasn't changed the estimations. Um, one of the things that none of us know, and I've, we've been working with uh, the city finance people is how soon things will recover and when that will be available. And that, that's a question that we'll all have to deal with as we go forward. But the, the estimate is, is there, the capacity will be there. When, when is it there will be determined by how our economy grows. Gotcha, thank you. Kevin, did you have a question? Uh, Mark actually asked my exact question, so no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, anyone I have else? A question. Yes. I have a question. Um, I know that historically we have called um, the current building that we have the big house, but have we considered changing that or getting rid of that name because of the historic connotations that it has? As the answer is no, that that's really a, a name that we've picked up based on the um, users have, have, are actually the ones who coined that phrase, the Oklahoma Secondary Schools Activity Association and the various high schools that, that um, participate in the building. That, it, that, it's not a formal name, it's more of a nickname and a, um, yeah, I guess more, that's a, more I think. anecdotal and informal, but, but I think that that's an interesting question and something that may, um, may think about shaping. Sure. Um, to that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think with that name, it was kind of connected to the older building. And as we move forward to creating the new building, I think that there is room to um, create a new nickname. And so then like the culture there will decide what that nickname will be. I don't think we're necessarily stuck to the, to the big house. I think that um, there's a lot of, right now there's a chance to uh, move forward and possibly, you know, curate a new name for this new building. So I don't think there's necessarily like a need to stick to that. I think it will happen organically and then we should trust the process because I mean, you know, a lot of different um, citizens or residents are part of this um, area. And I think it'll happen organically, maybe just not force it to the old one because as you know, we're getting rid of that building for this new one and change is coming and it will happen organically. I agree. That, that's how we got to where we are today. You're exactly right. Okay, I, I guess um, I just want to make note that I don't know that it would happen organic, organically here in Oklahoma. So that would be something that I would want to definitely see taken away from this particular project. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and that that that's awesome. And I think there's a chance here to do that. Yeah, and it's just up to us to um, push it forward, like you said, you know? Uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things that um, with maybe some subtle um, messaging and kind of starting to refer to the, the structure with a different title um, that, yeah, I, th I, I hear what you're saying, Monique, and I'm, I'm making a note that that's something that we want to try to influence. And Teresa, may I speak? Absolutely, Harry. Yeah. Um, I was surprised when I saw that in the presentation, not being an Oklahoma native. Uh, I mean, I understand it culturally having that. I think a simple solution is to just remove that from the slide presentation. Any any public things that, that we do from this point forward, it that doesn't hurt anything. I understand the connection that using that phrase makes with many people in the Oklahoma area, but with a lot of people moving in from outside. I don't know who's going to see this presentation. I just suggest dropping that that uh, phrase from that slide and and future presentations and I don't I think that'll be a good step to removing that from the culture of the Coliseum. Okay. Hey Teresa, may I comment yep. um, I, I share uh, Daisy's thoughts uh, about that. I think uh, something will develop just like with the uh, the, the Chesapeake Arena, we refer to it as the peak. It, it adopts its own nickname for the, the building. And I think uh, if and when this new Coliseum uh, is given a formal name, 
that may have something to do with how it's uh, referred. I don't know who might, uh, whose name might be used, uh, if, if any, for a while, but uh, uh, that will have some influence certainly on uh, how it's known colloquially. Colloquially. Right. Great. Good point. Good point. Thank you, Bob. Um, any other any other comments? Hey, Tim. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you making this presentation, and um, look forward to continue working with you as we move forward on this project. Thank you. So do we. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you, Tim. So our next presentation is um, Carrie Bloomert, uh, Commissioner Bloomert, um, on the mental health project, which includes the crisis centers, the restoration center, and mental health housing. Um, Commissioner Bloomert, welcome. We're so glad that you joined us today. Thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So the presentation is being pulled up, and similar to Mr. O'Toole, this is the presentation that uh, we gave about a year ago to City Council, and I am really glad to get to give this presentation to you all today and give some background on how we got to these particular projects. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So our big vision for any funding included in MAPS 4 related to mental health and related to addiction treatment is a community-based behavioral health treatment system that is responsive to all individuals with mental health and substance abuse disorders, especially skilled in serving, serving those who've been involved with our justice system. And when we say community-based, that just means we want to treat people and get them help before they need to actually go into some type of longer-term care facility. Uh, in the in the 80s and 90s, there was a big movement away from putting people in longer term care and putting them back at home and providing them treatment in their own community. And we want to keep moving in that direction and keep providing treatment to people and, and help them live as normal of a life as possible in their own community. So we know that mental health is, it's part of everyone's health. Uh, both mental illness and addiction are real medical conditions, just like diabetes, cancer, heart disease. They are diseases of our brain that can be appropriately diagnosed and treated. And every single year, um, researchers and physicians are learning more and more about how to appropriately treat mental illness and how to appropriately treat addiction. So even with illnesses that, that we once thought were untreatable, um, we have seen a, a, an advancement in treatment and recovery. We're always learning more. So in Oklahoma County, and I'm gonna read some statistics to you all, a lot of this information came from the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. And then some of this information came from our local law enforcement. So nearly one out of every five resident in Oklahoma County is actually in need of some type of mental health treatment. And then on the next slide, um, of those people who need mental health treatment, we estimate that four out of five aren't receiving the treatment that they need. And there's all different reasons for that. It might be not having insurance. It might be stigma. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't seeking the care that they need. And then when we think about our detention center or commonly referred to as our county jail, we estimate that 25 to 40% of people inside our jail need some type of mental health treatment or addiction treatment. And I actually, 25 to 40% is a pretty conservative estimate. I would actually think it's a little bit higher than that based on the public defenders I speak with and the staff inside the jail. So, so 25 to 40% is a pretty conservative estimate. So Oklahoma ranks 40th in adult mental illness and substance abuse. Obviously, we don't want to rank near the bottom. We want to rank near the top in, in how we are treating people and the care we're getting to them. So we have, we have a ways to go. And then Oklahoma also ranks 42nd in access to mental health care. And we know that back in June, um, Oklahomans approved Medicaid expansion. And so that will start to change how many people can access mental health care. So that's a really, really good thing. 
So this information came from the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. On the far right, you can see the highest column. That is the average amount that it costs per year to incarcerate someone with severe mental illness. So this would be someone who is in our um, Department of Corrections, who is in a state prison, who might have schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. It's very expensive to appropriately treat someone in, in one of our prisons. And then if you go to the left, the 15,000 is the average cost of a single hospital stay, also still very expensive. And then you go to the next column, uh, mental health court. Mental health court and drug court are very successful programs. Um, they are relatively inexpensive when you look at the cost of sending someone to prison. Um, we know that mental health court and drug court are not for everyone, but for the people who um, can work that program and stay in it, they're typically very successful. And then on the far left, $2,000 is the average cost of providing community-based treatment to someone with mental illness. That is um, a, a round number of someone who might get care at North Care or Red Rock or Hope, one of our community mental health centers. So it is, it is very expensive to incarcerate someone with severe mental illness, and it is a lot less expensive to provide people treatment up front and hopefully divert them away from our justice system. So the way we currently are paying for our justice system and our mental health treatment, we are, we're wasting a lot of taxpayer dollars because we're not investing upfront in people's treatment. Um, so right now, in, individuals with untreated mental illness are being incarcerated at alarming rates. Um, this not only strains our public resources for our law enforcement and for our detention center, but it makes recovery a lot harder for the individual. Once you spend time in that jail or you spend time in a prison, um, it, it, that can be a, a traumatic experience and it, it, it hurts your ability to, to recover faster and to get on the right track. So rather than institutionalizing those with mental illness, we should treat their disease so that they can become productive citizens. So SAMHSA is the Federal Department of Mental Health, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and they have identified three spots in the three locations in the justice system where you can intervene on behalf of someone's mental health. So at the, and, and there's even, I'm leaving out um, uh, even a before part of this presentation where you're providing um, mental health support and resiliency support to young children. Um, so I, I haven't included that in, the, in this slide, but the, the first box is pre-booking jail diversion and it's to keep individuals with mental illness and co-occurring disorders, which co-occurring just means you have been diagnosed with a mental illness and possibly um, an addiction or multiple mental illnesses. Um, it just means you have two, two diagnoses. So it's to keep individuals with mental illness and co-occurring disorders in the community rather than in the criminal justice system. And then the next point to intervene is institutional services. If someone has entered the justice system, it's to provide constitutionally adequate services in correctional facilities for people with mental illness and co-occurring disorders who need to be in the justice system due to the severity of their crime. There are people who who it is really not safe to have them out in the community and we, we recognize that and we need to be able to provide them adequate care when they're in a facility. And then of course we have re-entry um, transition and that is to link people with treatment um, when they go back into the community. And uh, I saw Ms. Arnall is, is on this, this call and we'll probably be speaking about her diversion hub, which that is really where the diversion hub is, is that is the, kind of their niche. Um, so just some advantages of community treatment that I talked about earlier, it helps people maintain relationships with their family and friends, which is oftentimes their support system. Um, care providers out in the community are more likely to be individual, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, care providers are more likely to be familiar with that individual's personal history, with their illness, personal history in their community. Um, discharge planning, whether you're coming out of a jail or you're coming out of a treatment center, um, is done by a person that is familiar in their community and knows what resources are available around that, that individual. Um, if you are receiving care in the community and you do need to enter into some type of 
longer term treatment, it's research has shown that your stay is a lot shorter because you you've already established care and you already are are seeing your providers. Um, it also has shown less time in protective custody. It's less trauma to the consumer or the patient, um, and it's fewer resources used by our law enforcement. So these are just some advantages to providing treatment in the community. And then I'll get into, in a minute, I'll get into um, how, how are we using our, our MAPS facilities to provide community-based treatment. So this map, there's a lot going on on this map, but the most important thing in the center of the map are two green plus signs. Those are the two current existing crisis centers in Oklahoma City and in Oklahoma County. So if someone is experiencing a mental health crisis and they are a danger to themselves or they are a danger to others, or they are in some type of um, psychosis, they really have no understanding of current reality and they need to get into immediate treatment and immediate help. Oftentimes 911 is called and officers will take that person to a crisis center. And a crisis center is not meant to be long-term care. It's meant to get that person stabilized get them in front of a, a doctor or a psychiatrist and possibly get them on medication and, and help them stabilize. So we only have two crisis centers in our whole county. And because of federal laws, those crisis centers only have 16 beds. So they are very limited in how many people they can serve. Each black dot on the map represents a transport by law enforcement to one of those facilities. So it's from all over the city and all over the county. This map does not take into account people from Canadian County, Cleveland County, Pot County, who law enforcement might be driving in to Oklahoma City to access those crisis centers. So this, this map really shows you that it is it hits every ward, it hits every part of our community of people needing access to these crisis centers. So safety for law enforcement. And when, when we were building this package of what we wanted MAPS to address with mental health, we had a lot of conversations with law enforcement, with Oklahoma City Police and our Sheriff's Department, and then other smaller police departments. And there are two crisis centers, like I said, that can only serve 16 people at a time. And oftentimes those beds are full. Um, actually, they're almost always full. So our law enforcement is having to drive people all across the state and do transports that are three to four hours one way, three to four hours back. And it is draining resources on our law enforcement. And it really would be a much better use of our money and our law enforcement's time to have more resources in Oklahoma City and in our, in our community. So this, this is a year, these stats are a year old. Um, this is the, because because I gave this presentation a year ago, but these are pretty average numbers for a typical month in Oklahoma City. So Oklahoma City has a program called CIT, Crisis Intervention Trained Officers. And that is a program that is used pretty widely throughout the United States. Almost every major law enforcement agency in Oklahoma has CIT officers. And they track in Oklahoma City, our CIT officers track uh, how many residents are making calls related to mental health, where those people are being taken and what is the result of that call. So in June of 2019, over 1600 calls were received by Oklahoma City Police Department that were related to mental health, some type of mental health crisis. Of those 1600 calls, over 800 people in crisis were transported somewhere by a law enforcement officer. They might've been taken to an emergency room. They might've been taken to a crisis center. Um, there, there are multiple different locations that an officer can take someone. I will say it is a lot more expensive to take someone to a uh, emergency room than a crisis center. Law enforcement officers traveled to 24 different locations in the month of June last summer to find a safe bed for someone who was in crisis. And then in the month of June last year, 22 people actually died as a result of a psychiatric illness, whether that was death by suicide or, or some other situation related to their mental illness. 
So in our in our maps for package, there's kind of three main categories. The first one is what we are calling the restoration center. I am not particularly tied to that name. We stole that name from San Antonio, um, which is in Bear County, Texas. They have a restoration center. And we actually took a group of about 15 people back in February down to their restoration center and got to see it and got to meet their staff and ask lots of questions. So a restoration center is essentially a crisis center plus detox. Um, a focus on addiction treatment. So a restoration center is a blend of mental health treatment and addiction treatment. Um, we hope that our restoration center will have 16 beds. Um, detox um, from, there are, uh, as, as addiction treatment providers, there are um, certain rules around detox for methamphetamines and then detox for other types of substances. Um, I also forgot to mention that in Oklahoma County, we actually only have one detox site. It is the um, TRC, the Recovery Center. It's at 25th and Classen. It is the only low cost uh, detox site in Oklahoma County. If you have access to good insurance, if you have the funds available, you can go through detox at a private facility but TRC is currently our only public detox facility and they always have a wait list. So uh, the restoration center will hopefully have 16 crisis beds, um, detox, medication assisted treatment for opioid addiction, a medical clinic. Um, so just a regular medical clinic. Hopefully we, um, we're not sure if, um, if this will, how this will fit in yet, but we would love to have a mobile crisis outreach team. And we don't know if this is going to be law enforcement paired with a social worker, law enforcement paired with a mental health provider. We're not sure yet. Depends on if we can find the funds for it. Um, it will hopefully have a pharmacy, um, temporary supportive housing, and I will go into that in detail in a little, a little bit. Um, a public inebriate alternative, which we already have one here in Oklahoma City um, uh, run by the OKC Metro Alliance. And that is just a safe place to take people who are publicly inebriated and it's really not best for them to go to jail, but they do need to be taken off the street. And then wraparound services and case management. And a lot of these services are, um, are provided at places like North Care Red Rock, the, the wraparound services and case management are provided at Red Rock and North Care and Hope. And, but Red Rock and, and North Care don't have the crisis center and the detox and a lot of those immediate services um, that, that law enforcement can work with. So I will not show this video. It is a, it is a tour of the, Christ, of the restoration center in San Antonio. So if you all are interested in that, I can send it to you later. So we added this slide in during our presentation for city council because there were some questions about what is the difference between the restoration center and Palomar and the diversion hub. So you'll get, I think you'll get to hear in a little bit more about the diversion hub. And, and I, I don't want to speak incorrectly, but the diversion hub is meant to serve people who are coming out of our jail to get them connected to resources. Palomar is to serve uh, people who are victims of violence, sexual violence, intimate partner violence, um, really connecting them with the right resources and keeping those clients safe. The Restoration Center is meant to be immediate mental health and addiction treatment, getting people stabilized who would otherwise might be taken to jail or to an emergency room. So the Restoration Center will mostly be staffed with nurses, doctors, uh, licensed alcohol and drug counselors, uh, more, more on the clinical side of things. And then also included in uh, our MAPS proposal is two standalone crisis centers. So we have the restoration center, which includes crisis beds, but there was there is such a need for these crisis centers that we felt it was appropriate to include two standalone crisis centers. And Crisis centers provide assessment, detox, um, de-escalation. Oftentimes people who are in crisis and who are interacting with law enforcement and 
it, the, the situation can escalate pretty quickly. Um, counseling, medications, and adequate sleep um, so that people can, um, like I said, it's that immediate uh, stabilization to get someone um, kind of back to a normal level. And then our third big piece of our proposal was single site supportive housing. And what we heard repeatedly from the jail and from the crisis centers was that when people are discharged and if they have nowhere, they have no home to go to when they're discharged, um, it is very hard for that person to stay on their medication, to stay on any type of treatment plan. It's very hard. Tulsa does a really good job at this. The Mental Health Association in Tulsa already has a site like this where they serve um, people who are transitioning out of jail, out of a crisis center, out of a hospital who have some type of mental illness. So our plan is to have 30 units of transitional housing for homeless individ individuals who are being discharged from crisis centers. This site would include 24 wraparound, 24 hour wraparound services to help individuals who do have severe mental illness, hopefully transition to permanent housing. So this will not be a permanent housing site. It will be more transitional. So our hope is to save taxpayer dollars with all of these projects. Um, each of these proposed facilities will save residents tax dollars. Crisis centers prevent individuals from being incarcerated. Um, those long-term wraparound services will prevent them from ending up in emergency rooms and supportive housing will help them keep them from experiencing homelessness. So this was the funding package that got included in MAPS. It's going to cost approximately $11 million for those two crisis centers. And this is all of these numbers. We worked in consultation with Department of Mental Health, Mental Health Association, law enforcement, and I think there's a slide in a minute that talks about all the partners we worked with. Um, we estimate that the Restoration Center will cost $22 million to build, and then the mental health housing will cost around $7 million to build. So our total funding was $40 million for mental health. And then these are uh, projected annual operating expenses. Again, this was, we came up with these numbers in consultation with a lot of different groups. These are all estimates, um, but based on the current crisis centers and their annual costs, we estimate that two new crisis centers will be about $5 million to operate. Restoration center will be a little over 13 million. Housing is a little under 1 million a year to operate. So, the big question with this proposal is where is this money going to come from? And I have started having conversations with private donors and private foundations. I don't feel comfortable sharing any of their names yet because we're still very early on in the process, but there is a lot of federal dollars for programs like this. And, for and I really think that is where we're going to access a lot of our operational dollars for these sites is through federal grants um, through SAMHSA. Um, this uh, pie chart is based on Bear County, based on their restoration center. 61% um, of funding for their center comes from state dollars. 13% is local funding. 10% is private billing to private insurance that patients may have. And then only 16% of their center comes from federal dollars. Texas, the way Texas funds a lot of their health centers is a little bit different than Oklahoma. So that's why they have such a big portion funded by the state. So these are all the partners that we were able to work with when we put together this presentation and put together this proposal. And it, it was really cool to get to hear everyone's input because almost, almost everyone had the same kind of ideas and, and no one had really talked to each other yet about it. So we, this, this proposal really came from all of these partners. And again, uh, data in this presentation came from Department of Mental Health, the Sheriff's Office, and OCPD. Great. I think that's all. Commissioner, thank you so much for your presentation. And so I would open it up to questions. This is Laura McDevitt in the City Attorney's Office. And I, this is a little bit awkward, but if we wouldn't mind doing a quick roll call, I just want to make sure that we still have um, which board members are in the meeting. And I think some might have their, their cameras off and just so we have a maintain a quorum. And so okay, thank you. Those on YouTube or those who may have called in. Thank you.
Teresa Rose Crook. Present. Russell Pace. Ali Shin. Present. Harry Black. Present. Shay Morris. Present. Brenda Hernandez. Present. Kevin Guinera. Present. Daisy Munoz. Present. Monique Bruner. Present. Bob Nealon. Present. Mark Stonecipher. Present. Fantastic. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Francie. Um, and thank you, Laura, for keep it, keeping us legal. Um, Bob, I think you had a question. I, I did. Commissioner, uh, this is Bob Nealon. Um, traditionally, MAPS has been more brick and mortar, and we've partnered with various operating partners to handle the projects we've done. MAPS 4 may be a little bit different. I think there may be funds for ongoing operating expenses, but as these centers are constructed, who will actually be the operator responsible for the day-to-day -day operation and oversight of the facility? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of the partners listed on that second to last slide are very interested in being the operating partners. Um, it, I, I believe this would be up to you all as a citizen board to decide if, if you do an RFP process and, and accept bids, um, but several of Red Rock, North Care, Mental Health Association, Hope, a lot of these agencies that are already in the mental health treatment space are really interested in, in being the operating partners. I, I think it's just up to which ones can find the operational funding and what their proposal is going to look like. So there's a lot up in the air, but from our conversations, there was a lot of interest from existing agencies. And, and Bob, you. I would add that this is one of the projects and I'm lumping it all together, but this is one of the projects that um, when city council approved it, it included a requirement that operating agreement in place um, prior to December 30th, uh, 2026, I believe, um, before the project moves forward. So there's, there's a few of these projects that we have, but as uh, Commissioner Bloomer describes, that's something that, that will be part of our process and part of our decision-making moving forward. Okay, good, thank you. Jay. Actually, I don't have a question, but I wanted to thank Carrie for uh, expanding a little bit on how this project uh, compares to uh, the Diversion Hub and, and Palomar. I have been, uh, I've been here three years. And so uh, this is all kind of new to me. And I've been trying to figure out how some of these projects might work together or um, overlap or whether there are any opportunities for collaboration. And, and so I found that very helpful. Thank you. Right. And I might have to depend on my fellow board members to uh, tell me a little bit more in general about whether or not these projects overlap, like the, the homelessness one, um, all of these issues can be so intertwined. And so I'm trying to understand them. So to make a long story short, thank you so much for, for giving me more information. Yes, Bob. Uh, just to echo what Shay said, uh, so many of the projects on the social side um, are interconnected. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges we have. Like in MAPS 3, most of the projects were pretty much standalone. And each subcommittee that was charged with that project was able to deal with it. Uh, not entirely in isolation. Obviously, things came back to the advisory board. But those subcommittees work pretty independently with respect to projects they have. I think it's going to be a real challenge for us uh, to make sure that as these various subcommittees deal with these projects, that we communicate with one another and do so at the subcommittee level rather than coming back to the advisory board and are having to look at it and saying, oh, wait a minute, that's inconsistent with what this other subcommittee is doing. That needs to be done at the very ground level. Uh, before it gets to the advisory board level. 
Absolutely. And I think that that is part of, and I'll give, I'll give a little shout out to uh, Councilman Stonecipher and his city council peers, along with the mayor of in this pro in, in maps for clustering those projects that stand next right. to each other, but require a different kind of expertise within the same subcommittee. So Shay, I think you're exactly right. And um, to Bob's point, having those, the, having the subcommittee be able to get in a little more granularly and, and understand as we're moving forward with the unique projects, how they interact and will lean in on each other, I think is critical to um, fulfilling our problems to the public, but also being efficient with their dollars. Um, and, and also one, Oh, go ahead, Shay. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Um, Shay, I would also encourage you and Carrie, if you would please, um, if we don't already have the video of the San Antonio Center, um, I think that, so I, from my previous role, was able to visit the San Antonio Center about 10 years ago. It is really remarkable. And um, so short of us jumping on a bus together and going down there, which I'm you know, not saying we won't get to do it sometime um, in the future, but I think taking a look at that video will help, help you put the concept together of what the restoration piece looks like. And because you know, San Antonio really has done a phenomenal job of um, putting, putting these pieces together. Yeah. So Gary, if you wouldn't mind sharing that video, I would ask you. Mark to send it out to everyone. And their, their center in Bear County was a, a, a building previously used for something else and they had to retrofit the building for their needs. So it's, I think the nice thing about Oklahoma City is that we will get to design the restoration center um, based on what we've learned from Bear County and what we need in Oklahoma City. Correct. Can I ask the question? Absolutely, uh, please. Um, Commissioner, you say that there's a law that only permits 16 beds. Um, can you elaborate? Yes, that? it's a it's a federal law that, and I haven't spoken to this in a couple of months, so I hope I can remember all of this. It's a federal law that has um, many members of Congress have per, uh, proposed bills to change it, that if you are billing um, Medicaid, Medicare for mental health treatment, you cannot have more than 16 beds. And I think the, the thought process behind that bill was to move away from large scale institutions where you are housing so many people. Um, in the 80s, we closed nationally, we closed a lot of those facilities because it just, they weren't being run very humanely. And so, from a federal standpoint, they wanted to make facilities small to encourage communities to treat people in their community rather than put them in a facility. So that's where I think that came from. But it really, from a crisis standpoint, it really limits how many people you can get help to immediately. Thank you. Any other questions of Commissioner Bloomer? Fantastic. Commissioner, thank you again so much for your focus on this project and um, your time today. Thank uh, you. Okay. Um, so moving on to item seven on our agenda is the presentation of the Housing for Homeless uh, project. And I believe we have uh, Ian Colgan and you're gonna be our primary presenter as I understand, but um, always have Don, Dan Strawn, um, good friend. Uh, that's here. At, Dan, are you presenting as well or is Ian taking the lead? I think I'm to start and Ian's to uh, bring it home. Fantastic. So. Tag team. Right. So if we can get our homeless presentation up. Dan, do you see playing an instrument? 
I, I do not. <laughs> I don't see anything either. Dan, we're able to pull it up here if you need us to. Uh, yeah, that'd be terrific. Okay. There we go. Okay, perfect. Uh, I assume everyone can see the map's homelessness. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having uh, us here today. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure listening to the uh, other presentations and I'm, I'm going to kind of run through the community need for maps for homelessness and workforce housing and then Ian with the uh, Oklahoma City Housing Authority um, will talk really more in detail about the project itself. Um, so um, in terms of need for housing in Oklahoma City, um, some of you may know that uh, the Homeless Alliance in the city of Oklahoma City conduct a uh, point in time count, a one night census of all the homeless in the city um, every January. So the 2020 census was January 23rd. On that day, we counted 1,573 uh, men, women, and children that were literally homeless in Oklahoma City. So those are people that are in homeless shelters um, or in places not meant for human habitation, under a bridge, in a tent, um, on a park bench. Um, that was an increase from the previous year and um, we also, most of the increase was a result of an increase in the number of unsheltered homeless. So you can see that went up almost 250 from 307 to 557 um, over the past five years. So we really had kind of an explosion of unsheltered homeless. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not even math, it's arithmetic. We have roughly 900 shelter beds and over 1,500 people experiencing homelessness. So our unsheltered numbers are always um, hampered by that. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, of Oklahoma City's approximately 1,600 homeless people on any given night, 17% are uh, uh, members of, of families with children. Just under 10% are veterans. Apropos of the commissioner's um, presentation uh, just a few minutes ago, 25% self-report severe mental illness and 6% were unaccompanied minors. We go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Of the adults, um, that we interviewed for the point in time count, two thirds, two out of every three say trauma contributed to their homelessness. 41% report being attacked or beaten, beaten up since they became homeless. 17%, almost one in five uh, report that a learning disability contributed to their homelessness. And 44%, nearly half have a chronic health issue. And obviously I don't need to, to say to the committee that that makes them particularly vulnerable to the current health crisis. So what's working in Oklahoma City? And it's interesting that uh, Ms. Morris and Mr. Nealon brought this up, this issue of collaboration. There's really a strong collaborative network in terms of um, care for people experiencing homelessness in our community. And, and it kind of extends beyond. So here at the Westtown Resource Center, you know, we have professional staff uh, from 25 different government faith-based and nonprofit agencies all co-located on, uh, on our campus. And then, and then now we're getting into almost a meta collaboration. So Palomar is a multi-agency resource center like Westtown is, but it's it's particularly for folks who are survivors of domestic violence issues. And the Homeless Alliance and other homeless providers have outplaced staff at Palomar diversion hub. Some of the clients that the diversion hub serves, the, the justice involved clients have issues with housing. And so the Homeless Alliance and other 
uh, agency, City Care, and others have outplaced their staff at the diversion hub. So that level of, of almost meta-collaboration between the multi-agency uh, resource centers that we already have in place in Oklahoma City is, is occurring now. And as these things like the mental health hub come along, um, and Carrie, uh, Commissioner Bloomer mentioned that North Care and Hope and Red Rock would all be potential operators of that mental health hub. North, North Care, Hope and Red Rock have staff here at Westtown and they have staff at Palomar. So, so there really is and if Oklahoma City does anything well, we do collaboration well. And it's, you know, it's the one bright, it's the one silver lining to be a community that's kind of a little bit prone to disasters between bombings and tornadoes. It has taught us that government, faith-based and nonprofit agencies really have to work together and, and we're, we're good at it. Um, what else is working in Oklahoma City? We have a shared IT infrastructure, information technology infrastructure that allows agencies serving the homeless to share data on shared clients so we know what each other is doing to help a client who has multiple barriers and is working maybe with multiple agencies. We settled uh, several years ago on a single intake and assessment tool that's used by most of the providers in the community. So uh, if, if you come into to West Town or go to North Care or City Care or City Rescue Mission or Jesus House or Grace, you get the same assessment and that's put into the information technology infrastructure so that we can ensure that people experiencing homelessness get to the agencies that can uh, are most likely to be able to help them. It also enables us as a community to prioritize people for services. Think of it like triage at, a, at an emergency room. So, right, you're gonna do the heart attack before you work on the broken ankle. Um, our assessment tool provides us with a numeric score that um, determines folks' acuity. And if think of acuity, it's just how likely are you to die on the streets if we don't get you into housing? And, and so we prioritize those folks to move first into housing. And um, having that cl close collaboration enables these teams of nonprofit, faith-based and government agencies to pool our resources um, to address clients with multiple barriers. We included this picture of Tabitha uh, and her child um, Partly because we know that everybody has a, uh, uh, a, a stereotype of who the homeless are in our community. And it's, and it's not what you think. It's not that 50-year-old uh, Old Testament prophet looking guy who's standing on a street corner muttering to himself. It is people like Tabitha. It, it, it is our neighbors, our friends, our sons and daughters. So next slide, please. So one of the things we have done in Oklahoma City, the Homeless Alliance brought to the community in 2012, was broadly adopted by the community in 2015, is this concept of housing first. It is housing without preconditions. It's not housing without conditions, but without preconditions. Um, Housing at some level is health care, it's mental health care. And so if you can just think about going to that guy under the bridge who has serious mental illness and saying to him, if you will get control of the voices in your head for 90 days, I will get you into housing. You, you, your chance of success is vanishingly small. On the other hand, if you can go to that guy and say, I can get you into housing and provide you the supportive services you need to address your mental illness, chances are success are exponentially greater. So that's what housing first is. We don't require sobriety to get into housing. We don't require stable mental health to get into housing. We don't require a job to get into housing. We get you into housing and then we work together on all those things. That model is a national and now international best practice. And in Oklahoma City, 
Um, you know, we were three or four years behind Tulsa in implementing that, but we've we've had uh, about eight years of experience with it and have become much more skilled at it. Next slide, please. So we've done a study of the cost of homelessness with particular emphasis on the use of emergency services. So during a six month window, we looked at 912 adults experiencing homelessness and um, found that they averaged um, nearly $10,000 in emergency services utilization. That's police, fire, EMSA, emergency uh, department and crisis centers. Um, and it doesn't count any of the costs incurred um, for just, just regular shelter services. But a total of over eight and a half million of just those 912 adults. We looked at a similar cohort of people housed uh, for the same period and saw a total cost, total cost, including emergency services of 5,500. So um, it, 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 it costs the community about half um to keep someone in housing than it does to leave them homeless so i don't know that it's always it's all that common to for the smart way to do the right thing also saves you scads of money so next slide please so more pictures of people that have gotten into housing over the last couple of years so what's the, we, we hear this a lot, what's the root cause of homelessness? And it's not to put too fine a point on it. If you ask a kindergartner, what's, what, what do we need to do for a person who is homeless? They're gonna look at you like, you're not really thinking this through and say, it's about homes, right? They're homeless, probably they need a home. And that's, that's exactly it. Um, in Oklahoma City, if I could wave a magic wand and instantly cure, permanently cure all mental illness and substance use, we would still have three quarters of our, our homeless population. Um, it, it's about the cost of housing in Oklahoma City versus the level of poverty in the community. So um, area we and and for folks that aren't familiar that that can be hard to to wrap your head around because we know that we have one of the most affordable housing markets in the country here in Oklahoma City and it's it's the definition of affordable where we get crossed up so when HUD talks about affordable housing they're talking about housing that is affordable to people that are making 80 to 120 percent of AMI AMI in Oklahoma City is a little over 50,000 we'll call it 50 to make the math easy. So if you are making between 40 and 60,000, we have a wonderfully affordable housing market in Oklahoma City. In the county, we have 135,000 people who live at or below the poverty line. That's not 40,000 a year, that's 12,000 a year. So while we have a very affordable housing market for people who are making 40, for that 135,000 that are making 12 or less, our housing is in no way affordable. And you can look on the on the slide, average one bedroom rent in 2019 was 776 a month. In order to afford that, you need to be making 1492 an hour for a 40 hour job. If you're working at minimum wage, you're gonna have to work more than 80 hours a week to afford that apartment. So um, the answer to homelessness in Oklahoma City is a for truly affordable housing. Can you see the next slide, please? The homeless camp in West Oklahoma City. Next slide, please. So Ian with the uh, Oklahoma City Housing Authority, um, it's going to take it from here. I'll stay for questions when Ian's done. Thanks, Dan. So the localized housing first strategy we propose to use 
targets a spectrum of housing options that are designed to assist people in varying stages, from those experiencing homelessness to those at risk at home, of homelessness. The first area is a major expansion in the supply of permanent supportive housing. Supportive housing is an intervention that combines affordable housing assistance with voluntary support services to address the needs of chronically homeless people. These services are designed to build independent living and tenancy skills and connect people with community-based healthcare, treatment, and employment services. The National Alliance to End Homelessness estimates that permanent supportive housing has been used to help decrease the number of chronically homeless individuals by 26% since 2007. The second area is public housing preservation. The city's stock of 3,000 public housing units plays a crucial role in addressing homelessness. Hundreds of people formerly experiencing homelessness already live in public housing and provides a crucial safety net that prevents extremely low income households from falling further into poverty and homelessness. Unfortunately, federal funding to operate and maintain public housing has dropped sharply over the past decade, and there even have been proposals to cancel it altogether. Without substantial renovation or replacement, those housing units may start to become uninhabitable within a decade. Once lost, it is virtually impossible to replace this housing. A defining feature of our strategy is that case management and other wraparound services will be made available to every resident in this network of per permanent supportive housing and refreshed public housing. Addition, in addition to these two categories, given the amount of land already owned by the housing authority, we believe there's an opportunity to create at least 500 more affordable housing units within this program. So for a total of approximately 4,000 renovated or new housing units serving extremely low or very low income households. Next slide. These additional units, whether built separately or integrated into redevelopment initiatives, will complete a network of housing that will be used to reduce homelessness and increase self-sufficiency. By creating this ladder of sustainability, which reaches from issues of chronic homelessness all the way to economic self-sufficiency, we believe that Oklahoma City will be creating one of the most innovative and effective programs of homelessness reduction and prevention that will not only address issues at present, but also in the future. Next slide. The defining feature of this proposal is our ability to leverage additional funding to achieve scale. Using only MAPS funds, we would only be able to produce a small number of units. However, there are numerous resources already in existence to build affordable housing including the low income housing tax credit, which has, been, which has been used to build the majority of affordable units across the country since its inception in 1986. The difficulty in creating housing to serve people experiencing homelessness and extremely low income is that these existing resources don't extend far enough, creating a gap in funding that is difficult to fill. With MAPS funds, however, this gap will be removed and will, with a proposed allocation of $50 million, we estimate the ability to leverage $400 plus million in private debt, equity, and other grants or loans to complete this program. The strategy helps achieve the truly transformative program in our proposal. Next slide. Like others that have done their research, an advantage to this program is that we will not be trotting new ground. This program is designed around results that we know are achievable because there are many previous examples right here in the community. The first example is the Altamont, which is in Tulsa. This is a former, former hotel. The building was converted to permanent supportive housing in 2019 for a cost of 2.7 million, a combination of city and state funds, and now serves 39 formerly chronically homeless individuals with disabilities. Next slide. For public housing, the renovation of Sooner Haven Apartments on the Northeast side is currently underway and represents the first comprehensive construction or renovation of public housing in the city since 1979. The Housing Authority invested $2 million to leverage another $25 million in outside sources so that it could substantially renovate the property's 150 units, giving it another 30 to 40 years of operational lifespan. Next slide. 
Pivot, a turning point for youth, is currently building a tiny home community for teens who are homeless, uh, as well as the, those youths aging out of foster care. Uh, these are these photo shows the first three homes that were built and, and are being occupied, I believe now, uh, and they're being expanded upon with various sources uh, right now. Next slide. Another example is in 2018, uh, the Community Enhancement Corporation, which is an instrumentality of the Housing Authority, purchased Mount Vernon Apartments with the intent of renovating and stabilizing the apartment community for workforce housing, but also to include rental assistance for low-income families. This is an apartment building that otherwise would have been sold to a market rate investor and rents increased by as much as two to $300 a month. Um, but we acquired it, renovated it and, and kept the uh, rents at a, an affordable rate so that we could increase uh, the supply of affordable housing in the community. Next slide. And finally, Creston Park is a multi-phase initiative by the Housing Authority uh, set to start construction later this year. It, in, it includes 159 public housing units that will be removed and replaced with 500 affordable units uh, for varying ages and, and housing types. It's a great example of how we can take existing land and opportunity and expand affordable housing with this program rather than uh, just uh, focus on replacement housing. This is a good example of how we can create additional units, uh, perhaps even above and beyond you know, the 500 that we, we project uh, is, is very easily possible. Next slide. So another aspect of the program that uh, relates to not only just, uh, uh, relates to homelessness and housing is, is workforce housing. Um, Backing up and looking a little bit more globally, um, you know that this program talks about uh, so the so-called bricks and mortar uh, related to housing, and we all know that housing is produced by the private sector every day of the year, uh, whether it be single-family homes or apartments or, or whatnot. So, how does this program relate to a uh, land use type that is built by the private sector every day? Well. We, we look at that and we look at the types of housing along an income spectrum that are built very easily by the private sector and those that are not built easily by the private sector. So if we, we look at this generalized spectrum, we look at market rate or luxury housing um, or our middle market housing, typically the resale of, of existing homes and existing neighborhoods or even low income affordable housing around 60% plus or around 60% plus of a very median income. All those areas uh, are, can achieve what we call efficient market delivery. There's tools out there in the community that uh, developers can use either just from their own you know, construction and income or government programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit that allow for the construction of these types of homes. What isn't as available are one, extremely low income housing. So when we take the rents that are needed to uh, meet people experiencing homelessness or people uh, a threat, threatening to experiencing homelessness, that financial gap opens. And uh, that, is, that is a level of income that the private sector simply cannot efficiently produce without substantial government assistance from other sources. Another area that is similar to that although albeit at a, a slightly higher income level is workforce housing, particularly in high cost areas. So that's, we're talking 60 to 80% of AMI, but in places like downtown Oklahoma City or some of the neighborhoods nearby that are experiencing high uh, uh, real estate growth. It is getting, is increasingly difficult uh, to provide housing at a certain income, for a in certain income level, um, because the costs are increasing and increasing. And this is a trend we see all across the country where people are simply priced out, out of opportunity areas. Uh, Oklahoma City has invested quite a bit of money to realize real estate growth within these areas, particularly downtown. We wanna make sure that uh, people with uh, more modest means still have accessibility to those areas and the amenities that they offer. Next slide. 
quickly, this is just a, a brief example of census tracts across the city where housing costs are increasing faster than the, than the city average. So, you know, looking at areas where, you know, uh, housing costs may quickly outstrip um, people's ability to live there and access it uh, and, and will have to move out or may even become at risk of homelessness. Next slide. So overall, the results of this program will be a transformative platform designed to reduce barriers to homelessness, provide self-sufficiency, avoid millions of dollars of additional public sector costs that will go in to treat uh, people who do not have a successful housing first program, uh, as well as creating rental and home ownership opportunities uh, affordable to working families so that everyone can access the city's most desirable neighborhoods. Next slide. Uh, this initiative is a uh, collaborative among uh, several agencies. We have a housing authority and homeless alliance represented today, but uh, there's also the Alliance Pivot and um, uh, Mental Health Association uh, as we propose to target um, persons experiencing chronic homelessness, youths uh, experiencing homelessness and aging out of foster care, veterans housing, as well as um, uh, people experiencing barriers to mental health as our, our particularly focus on the permanent supportive housing side. And with that, uh, we both are available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Dan and Ian, so much for that presentation. And um, so I would open it up to questions. Anybody have a question? Ian, this is Russell Pace. What <clears throat> you've proposed several different types of housing redevelopment of apartments. What is the uh, preferred development strategy and what parts of town do you envision those would like to see those being built in? There's a balance. So there, there are obviously existing public housing sites that uh, have existing assets that we would look at as opportunities, not only to improve the housing, but potentially even as catalysts for economic development within the area, revitalization. That's an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity to take housing located in um, areas where it doesn't really work, uh, where because housing, uh, public housing traditionally has been put uh, in places where people don't really want it. And uh, there's opportunities to find locations where there are better access to uh, amenities and, and jobs and, and aspects for residents. Um, and the same goes true of the permanent support of housing. And I think overall, there's a balance between proximity to services, particularly for the permanent support of housing and balance and, and um, ensuring that, you know, they're in neighborhoods with good access to uh, things that allow people to succeed. Um, so it's, it's a real combination of, of fixed assets that we have already, uh, as well as uh, looking out for opportunities to renovate or construct new housing in, in places where we, we think the particular population for that property would, would most succeed. Do you envision some more tiny house communities? I think the discussion, um, we've had discussions with Pivot on their uh, um, program. Um, there's a possibility of expanding the tiny home community or uh, all possibly building programs that actually are the next step in housing for those youths. Uh, whereas the tiny homes offer an opportunity as, as that entry level access to housing, uh, but there might be a higher level of services or other type of housing that youths benefit from um, at, a, at a different level. Uh, some of it relates to the operating subsidy we can bear to the properties, uh, which relies very heavily on uh, federally federal project-based rental assistance with ha which has its own rules and regulations for how it's applied. Um, so we haven't designed the pivot or the youth program just yet, but we're, those are the various options we've looked at. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions of Dan or Ian? 
Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, this is a project that I think is, is timely, if not past due, and critically important for our community. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. So uh, our final presentation, item eight for today, is the presentation of the Diversion Hub. And today we have with us Sue Ann Arnall and uh, Megan Taylor, who is the Director of Programs for the Arnall Family Foundation. So ladies, I will let y'all take it away. You're muted. There you go. I apologize on that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's okay, so I can um, go ahead and control kind of the presentation. Yeah, perfect. There. Oh, yep. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. We're just about there. How do I remove that? Okay. Hello, I'm Sue Ann Arnall. I'm uh, president of the Arnall Family Foundation and also of the board of the Diversion Hub. The Diversion Hub has been a dream of mine for a couple of years, but uh, it's been the dream of many others in Oklahoma City for a lot of years. And we actually created it with the input and help of uh, several stakeholders in the community. At Arnold Family Foundation, we look for gaps in the community, and our work in foster care revealed that a large number of those children had biological parents who had been in jail or prison. And so we started looking at the criminal justice system, and we identified systemic failures. And addressing those failures is what led us to the Diversion Hub and understanding what others have been dreaming about. We are extremely grateful to be included in the Oklahoma City Maps for projects, and I thank you all for volunteering your time to make the projects a reality. And Megan Taylor is the Director of Programs for the Hub, and she will take it from here. Thank you so much, Ms. Arnall. Um, Again, my name is Megan Taylor. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Oklahoma City Diversion Hub. I want to start off by giving kind of a formal what is the Diversion Hub and who are the who's a part of the leadership that we have currently. So the Diversion Hub is a comprehensive one-stop network dedicated to assisting justice-involved individuals in Oklahoma City by harnessing the power of multiple support agencies through combined and collaborative services. Our goal is to provide life-stabilizing resources while empowering individuals to reduce their encounters with the criminal justice system through enhanced support services, including case management, data integration, and coordinated communication under one roof. Uh, the current leadership that we have here at the Oklahoma City Diversion Hub is uh, Damon Brayton serving as the Executive Director, myself over programs, and Mr. David Dickerson, um, the Director of Operations. Uh, Mr. Brayton wasn't able to be here today, um, but he has a message for you all. The volume is very low. I can't hear that at all. It's my understanding that the volume was too low, and so most of you all probably didn't hear that. I actually had it maxed out on our end, so um, I know you guys were going to have a copy of this presentation, um, so hopefully the volume will be a bit better on that. But basically, he said hello and thank you for listening to us. So why the Diversion Hub, why are we here, and, and why do we need that? Um, so what we first started looking at, looking at are really what are the needs of our Oklahoma City neighbors that have been impacted and affected by the criminal justice system. We started off by taking a very basic look at what the top five charges of those arrested and booked into Oklahoma County Jail were. And this data was provided to us by the Oklahoma City Police Department. 
um, as we started looking at what the top five arrests were, we started realizing that there were a lot of gaps that we would be able to fill and assist those individuals and thereby reduce their encounters with the criminal justice system. As you can tell on here, we've got failure to appears for felonies leading the um, bookends in Oklahoma County Jail in 2020. Public drunkenness, failure to appear on misdemeanors, no state driver's license, and larceny of merchandise. Um, the failure to appears on both the felony and the misdemeanors, those are not new charges. Those are when individuals have failed to appear for court-ordered appearances. Um, this quickly got us to um, the need to launch some pilot programs um, based on these criminal justice reform initiatives um, with the public defender's office and the district attorneys. Um, this started off uh, simply by looking at what those top five arrests were and how we would be able to help mitigate those bookends and also connect those individuals to life stabilizing resources and services to reduce their encounters with the system. So how we got here, we launched our pilot programs with the public defenders and district attorneys, as well as the judiciary in Oklahoma County. Um, the four areas that we tackled were that of uh, failure to appears, uh, probation compliance, cost warrants, and then providing justice navigation to those that the court has determined to be no risk to public safety, but needed a little bit of assistance with navigating their criminal case. So we launched these pilot programs all of 2018, and we learned a ton. Uh, we're still learning a ton, but I think the most important part of us starting the development of the Diversion Hub was learning from the key stakeholders in the community, in the criminal justice system, and those impacted and affected the most. Um, we recognized quickly a need for services to be coordinated in one location for high-level collaboration and effectiveness. Um, we hosted focus groups and community meetings with over 100 people in the community to identify what the needs were, what the gaps were, um, so that we could actually fill what those needs were in the community. Um, we formed a 13-person advisory committee. Um, we hired a consulting company out of Colorado by the name of TriWest that assisted us with our strategic plan. We developed and are currently still develop, developing an evaluation plan, and we identified a phase one location within Oklahoma City in proximity to our key stakeholders in the, in the courthouse, the municipal courthouse um, in the Oklahoma County Jail. I think an important thing um, during these focus groups that we, we learned quickly is that we spoke with individuals with lived experience, law enforcement, uh, bail bonds, community uh, leaders, criminal justice leaders, law enforcement, um, and in collaboration, hearing what those needs are from those communities that are in the trenches every day with criminal justice. This is the uh, advisory council that helped us develop the Diversion Hub. Um, I am incredibly honored to have had such an in incredible group of community and criminal justice um, leaders. These leaders in the community dedicated a significant portion of their time over the course of about a year um, to help us develop this unique, innovative model that the Diversion Hub is and continues um, to grow into with the assistance of your help. Okay, so this, these are the proposed costs that we put together as a team. Um, these are by no means a solidified um, proposal. We anticipate working with, with the council and with the, or with the community as we develop a more solidified um, proposal of those numbers. Funding. The Diversion Hub will rely on a public-private partnership for funding. Um, with the generous funding donations from um, the Arnold Family Foundation and the Kirkpatrick Foundation of roughly $27 million, this has been um, how we've been able to open and start, start tackling the need in our, in our community. Um, and then the $17 million uh, for infrastructure from MAPS4. I also want to add um, that 
A couple months ago when we started developing our, our revenue stream for operations, we started looking aggressively at federal grants that were out there and actually applied for a federal DOJ grant in collaboration with North Care and the county to increase our mental health and substance abuse, substance abuse um, treatment for the clients that are being served by the Diversion Hub. We will continue to, to seek out federal grant opportunities because we do believe, um, based on, on the evidence and, and time developing the Diversion Hub, that there are a lot of federal dollars that are not being allocated here to Oklahoma City. Timeline. Um, so I wanted to go through this briefly because we are a bit of a unique position with us having worked um, in this world for two years with our pilot program. So in November 2018, we launched our criminal justice um, initiatives out of the Public Defender's Office as we started developing the Diversion Hub and what it was going to do in the community and who it was going to serve. Um, in 2019, we started our focus groups. Um, we developed our advisory committee. We met with them over the course of a year. Um, we developed our strategic plan and evaluation model, and again, still working on the evaluation model as we learn more. Um, in February of 2020, we leased a space, um, and we started uh, bringing in new staff and remodeling that to be conducive for the work we were going to be doing. Um, we anticipated an April 2020 open date. Um, however, the global pandemic postponed that to June of 2020. Um, I want to add on this that Throughout the entire pendency of the development of the Diversion Hub up until we opened our doors in our new location, uh, we were on the ground working and serving the community at large. Um, the, indivi the indigent individuals that the Public Defender's Office has have served for so long, we were able to provide them an additional layer of support. Um, and so when we opened in, in June of 2020, uh, we actually were serving a roughly 600 clients. Uh, we were serving 600 clients in a capacity of justice navigation and case management. Um, in February, in March, April, when COVID um, started really becoming something that the city was starting to take an initiative on, on tackling, uh, we were on the ground collaborating with the Public Defender's Office um, to get folks out of the Oklahoma County Jail that did not, risk, uh, did not pose a risk to public safety and got them connected to, to resources out in the community so that they would be safe as well as, as the facility, um, the Oklahoma County Jail. How it works. So a lot of arrows and a lot of content on there. So I'm just gonna kind of briefly talk about what it would look like for a client to come through the first time. Um, a client comes through our doors and meets with an intake specialist um, at that first interaction. That intake specialist is actually a case manager that conducts intakes one day a week. All of the clients that that case manager conducts the intake on will roll into that case manager's caseload. So we were strategic and methodical about that. We wanted to have that increased quality continuum of care. Um, and we didn't want, uh, we wanted to be focused on um, not re-traumatizing our clients over and over again. Um, so at that first interaction, um, the case manager, a justice navigator, and the client conduct an emergency needs assessment. Um, what we're looking at at that emergency and needs assessment is how do we get this individual safe and stable for right now. The case manager is looking at housing, um, looking at clothing, um, there's food insecurity, hygiene, um, transportation, and our justice navigators at the same time doing a cursory search of all of the criminal justice involvement in all of Oklahoma. Um, everybody that comes through our doors um, has justice involvement of some, of some form to be qualified. And so that individual has two teammates on their side. They've got the case manager, but they've also got the justice navigator to assist them with being in compliance with whatever the court has put forward. The next uh, interaction is the client comes back within 48 hours to do a deeper needs, strength and needs assessment with the case manager and justice navigator. What this strength and needs assessment is, is it's looking at the strengths and the weaknesses of the client, and we develop a service plan based on that. So we've got short-term goals and we've got long-term goals. The client and the case manager regularly meet. We're looking at roughly either once a week or every other week, um, depending on the level of need of the client. 
Um, and then the case manager will refer out to service providers that are either in-house at the diversion hub or out in the community. As you can see on this slide, we've got some of the service providers, mental health, justice navigation, employment, housing, benefit navigation, probation, and again, some of those are in-house and some of those are out in the community. So our current on-site partners um, are listed here. So I, the model of the diversion hub is that collaboration is essential and is everything. And not duplicating the services that are being done by great agencies in the community already. So that was key and that was a fundamental thing as we were developing the diversion hub. So what we do is we bring in those experts opposed to trying to make our staff experts in a wide range of services and resources that, that benefit our clients. And so we bring those experts in-house and we empower them with high level um, connection and collaboration um, all with the benefit for, for our clients that we're serving. Um, we've got City Care and Homeless Alliance um, that are uh, full-time on-site for housing. We've got Work Ready Team and Urban League assisting us with employment needs. We've got uh, North Care for substance abuse and mental health. We've got Front Porch Initiative um, for our benefit navigation. And then we have Bail Project here, which is a nonprofit that assists individuals that are in custody solely based on their indigent um, inability to make bond. Maybe describe the Front Porch Initiative. Yeah, and so the, the Front Porch Initiative is an incredible um, benefit to the clients that come through um, the Diversion Hub. We knew from our experience in the pilot programs over the past two years that um, being an expert in benefits is very, very difficult. Um, it could actually, I mean, that is something that can take your entire life to become experts in. And so we knew we weren't going to effectively be able to, um, to provide that assistance without bringing in experts. Um, the Oklahoma Front Porch Initiative um, is a program through the, the governor, um, Governor Stitt, and run through Mr. Bates and uh, Secretary Budd. The intent of the program is to increase our efficiency and effectiveness with, with benefits, um, improving the interaction between the agencies and the customers. Um, and what we've learned is that there are a lot of benefits that our clients um, would be eligible for that by getting them connected to those benefits, we're, in, we're thereby removing those barriers for a lot of them. Um, organically, the way that um, we started benefiting, or clients started benefiting through the Front Porch Initiative is getting connected with, with food stamps, um, with SNAP. Um, if an individual is eligible for SNAP, they're also eligible for specific employment training through one of our other partners, uh, Work Ready. And so this collaboration has been able to open up um, benefits and remove barriers just by having that under one roof um, collaboration. So who do we serve? Uh, we are low barrier entry, but we had to put parameters to um, be successful. So who we serve? We serve justice involved individuals in Oklahoma County District Court who are at risk of being revoked on probation or accelerated to a convicted status and or those individuals in the pretrial phase of their case. The shuttle, um, I hope some of you have seen our Diversion Hub shuttle um, driving around downtown. It, is, it has been a huge benefit for our clients and the community within the criminal justice system. In 2018, when we started these pilot programs out of the Public Defender's Office, uh, we identified lack of transportation as being one of the leading barriers for our clients. Um, we got creative for two years, um, but we knew that um, we needed to remove that barrier for our clients. Um, so we decided that we were going to get a shuttle for um, the benefit of our clients that would go within the Oklahoma City downtown area. So this uh, shuttle bus runs Monday through Friday all day, and um, we do a fixed route between the Oklahoma County Jail, the Diversion Hub, the Oklahoma County Courthouse, and the Oklahoma City Municipal Courthouse. Um, we've expanded the route for the, the shuttle to service-related appointments, um, again, removing those barriers so our clients can be successful.
Sorry, guys, I'm having a little difficulty getting to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so what is the community impact that, that we are having and seek to continue to have? Um, safer communities, reduced jail population, lower recidivism. Um, public safety is of great importance to us. Every single day we are working to improve public safety for our neighbors in the community, um, including our clients. So how do we build safer communities? Um, the evidence and studies show that we connect these individuals to life-stabilizing life, life resources and services that will aid them in becoming self-sufficient and stable. Um, restoring hope is something that we saw as an intangible thing that would really aid in the success of our clients. Um, when we started working with clients, we started realizing that a lot of our clients that we're working with in the criminal justice system are without hope. They're picking the best option that they have, um, but they really don't have any good safe options to pick. And so by restoring the hope every day, um, by broadening their options, and help guiding them to the better, safer options, we're building safer individuals in our community. Um, by doing that, we are lowering recidivism and we're reducing jail population. Um, reducing jail population, again, with those, those pilot programs that we ran um, out of the Public Defender's Office, um, tackling those two contribu contributors to being booked in on the, the failure to appears was an area that we wanted to tackle. Um, because we knew that there were barriers preventing folks from getting to their court-ordered appearances. So what are, what are, we, what are the measurables and, and what are we looking at for outcomes? Um, Short-term outcomes, reduced failure to appears for those engaging with Diversion Hub. Um, there are a lot of trickle-down effects with someone being booked in Oklahoma County Jail on failure to appears. Um, when someone fails to appear, a failure to appear warrants issued, that individual is picked up, booked into Oklahoma County Jail, and their bond is actually denied until they get seen before the judge that they failed to appear on. Um, we know that that can be within 24 hours or it can be within three to four days, depending on when that individual is booked into county jail. But what we also know is that we're destabilizing that individual even more than we were before. So what we were what we were learning from those individuals is that they were failing to appear for a slew of reasons, um, not that of criminogenic behaviors. So we're looking at lack of transportation. We serve a massive um, population that's experiencing homelessness. And so being able to keep track of these court dates that are spread out sometimes over the course of, of three months is difficult um, for these individuals. And so there were a lot of these barriers that we knew we could remove and effectively began removing and thereby decreased the number of failure to appear warrants that were going out. Um, second, number of successful probation completions. Um, one of the initiatives we ran and are still running is helping individuals be compliant on probation. Um, we know the evidence shows that that's a direct pipeline to uh, an individual being accelerated to a convicted status um, and or worse off being revoked and sentenced to prison. We started off um, again working with the district attorney who had identified a significant need to help these individuals. Uh, we were seeing a lot of individuals with monetary or technical violations, um, not individuals that were reoffending. Um, and committing crimes within the community. And so we started by working with those individuals on a case management and justice navigation basis, and we've been able to see significant success um, lowering the individuals booked into county jail on probation violations, but also on the judiciary, lowering the individuals on those dockets um, for, for years at a time. Client successes. Um, every day we're connecting clients to employment um, that's different for every client. Sometimes uh, temporary employment while they're working on job training is necessary. Whatever is necessary for our client, we look at on an individualized basis to get them successful and self-sufficient. So we're looking at employment, we're looking at housing every day, um, and working with our great partners from the Homeless Alliance and City Care. Um, we're looking at substance abuse, we're looking at mental health, 
um, benefit navigation, um, assistance with the financial component with the criminal justice system. That is a, a big issue. So we're helping with um, modifications and waivers of fees when individuals are indigent and can't keep up with those. Um, Long-term goals, reduced number of individuals detained pretrial. So someone's detained pretrial, they get arrested um, and a bond is set. These individuals that we serve cannot get out of jail. They're indigent. And so we see them sitting in jail pretrial, meaning before they're convicted, um, for a increasingly long period of time. And again, studies show there are trickle effects with the trickle down effects of someone being detained pretrial. Um, lowering recidivism for individuals engaged with the diversion hub. Um, we're constantly measuring um, if our clients are getting connected with the right life stabilizing resources and services, if they are effectively um, reducing their interactions with the criminal justice system. And so that is something that we will constantly measure um, and we will measure on different variances. And then lowering prison admissions. Um, we've been collaborating with key stakeholders in the criminal justice system to stem the flow of individuals going from pretrial to prison. Um, and we know that we can lower that with the collaborative model that we have in place. Um, just for a little bit of numbers, and they're not included on here, um, in 2019, roughly about nine months of us working um, at arraignment with the public defender's office um, on getting individuals out that the judge has determined not to be a risk to public safety, um, we've been providing justice navigation. So what that looks like is we help individuals that are a bit higher need, that are indigent in custody, with getting connected to, to legal counsel, um, being compliant on the pretrial conditions set forth by the court, um, and then getting to court. Um, the criminal justice system is a absolutely confusing place for lawyers and judges, um, for our clients that are that are suffering with significant barriers and have for a majority of their life, it's insurmountable. And so we're there to walk that with them. Um, but again, in 2019, again, roughly about nine to 10 months, uh, we saw 358 bench ORs. So those individuals released on their own recognizance that otherwise wouldn't have been released based on their high level of need. So we're looking at a homeless population sitting in custody um, because the court measures the risk and determines that they don't have anything to help them be successful when they get out. And so what we did was we stepped in and we said, we can provide a navigation for these individuals. 83% of the individuals that we worked with over the course of the nine months out of the public defender's office showed up to court. That's a really great number. Um, again, I, I, my, I worked in the criminal justice system as a district attorney first, and failure to appear is, is an issue every day for every docket. And so 83% of our individuals that are high need, showing up to court, getting their cases disposed of, and having a fighting chance is really what we're seeking to do on that. So where are we now? Um, we are now serving roughly 500 clients in a case management and justice navigation capacity, um, collaborating daily with our on-site partners and then the great community partners we have um, out in the community. Um, we are currently working out of a 10,000 square foot location that we remodeled and tailored to our needs in um, Midtown. Um, we are bursting from the seams. We have filled every single um, area of our office with staff, with partners, all in the benefit of our clients. Um, we are looking to expand um, and grow about 5,000 square feet. So roughly we, in a couple months, we will be expanding to 15,000 square feet. Um, again, we're finding closets, crevices, places for our staff to, to work and to meet clients where they're at. And so the need to expand to a roughly 30,000 square, square foot facility is based on our on the ground work um, and us having to get creative with our location here. And I think it's really important to know, again, we opened our doors serving 500 to 600 clients. That is a lot of clients to be serving um, during a global pandemic. And so when we opened our doors, the need um, and the volume was absolutely apparent.
Testimonials. So since we have been working in this arena for the past couple of years, we wanted to share some testimonials directly from our clients. Um, our clients are, are why we're doing the work we're doing. They're neighbors in Oklahoma City, um, and these are individuals that needed hope to be restored, needed connection to life-stabilizing resources and services, and have been successful in self-sufficiency and stability. Um, just a little bit of story uh, quickly. Um, Lottie is one of our clients that we received through our probation compliance initiative. This was in collaboration again with the district attorney and the public defender who identified that this individual um, just needed additional support. Um, since we started working with Lottie, she has had her probation case um, dismissed. She has been permanently housed with the help of Homeless Alliance and her case manager, Summer Kaiser. And we have consistently worked on increasing her stability with employment. Um, this is huge. This is success. Um, this is a neighbor in, in Oklahoma City that um, was lost and really felt that she didn't have any hope to keep fighting. Uh, Devonte, um, an incredible client we've been working with for the past two and a half years. Um, again, Devonte came to us on a probation violation. Um, he wasn't able to keep up with the financial component. He had experienced a lot of hurdles in his life that had derailed him and had him to a point of giving up. Uh, we worked with him. Um, the district attorney um, gave us some time on the probation case so that we could get him successful. Uh, Devonte is working every day on his GED. He is working on uh, job training. He is winning, he's working while he's working on job training. Um, he's working on housing. He is at our office every day utilizing our resources to better himself. And again, this is, this is what self-sufficiency and success looks like. Tracy, another incredible client um, that we've been able to help and, and restore some hope so that she has a fighting chance. Uh, Juan is one of uh, another incredible client um, that uh, has a unique perspective of how we have been able to assist him. Um, Juan was someone that I worked with the public defender's office to get out um, during COVID. We're still in COVID, but really when it was ramping up and we were trying to collectively identify um, how we were going to assist those in custody. Um, Juan lost his wife um, two years prior to this. He had a stable life, and that derailed him completely. That was the catalyst for, for homelessness for him, um, and he was lost. Um, I was able, we were able to get him out of um, jail based on the fact that he was only in on failing to comply with some financial components of a probation case. Um, this was a 2013 case. We got him out. We got him connected to emergency housing. We got him engaged with job training. We got him engaged with benefits that he hadn't been utilizing. Um, we got his application dismissed by the court. Um, now he is working seven days a week at Cattlemen. So if you guys ever run into him, say hi, because he is um, ecstatic to be there and to be working and to have control over his life finally. Um, and again, this is another individual we've been able to permanently house in collaboration with our in-house partners, City Care and Homeless Alliance. Another client. We have a few, sorry. <laughs> and these, again, these are clients that, um, that we have been working with for a good chunk of time um, and have seen true self-sufficiency and success with them. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. You bet. Uh, Megan and Sue Ann, thank you so much for your presentation and your comments today. So I'd open it up to questions. Any questions? Yeah, I do. Okay, Harry. You mentioned the statistics from 2019. You've been open at your current location just since June, I know, just a couple of months. But what is the, what's the current caseload, did you say, or did you say that? 
Yeah, so it changes every day because we get new clients every day, but we were at 450 as of my most recent search. And those are clients that are engaged with case management and justice navigation. And we have clients leaving with their cases closed, some of the easier ones and then some of the ones they've been working with for a long time. We've had up to one day, I think we had 70 people walk through the door, yeah. but typically it's about new people new and existing. Typically, it's 10 to 20 people yeah. coming in. Yes. And the clients, we're getting, the need is so great. We found this huge gap. And the need is great. And frankly, it's a little bit overwhelming. But we're going to do our best. And we're going to control, control it so we can have quality case management. And so that every client gets the service that they need. Well, and they're set up for success. Yes, Good. we want to set up for success. Thank and you. Russell, did you have a question? I did not at this time, thanks. Okay, Mark? Yes, please. Um, the shuttle system, can you go a little more in depth about how that works? I mean, does it go to the, uh, does it go to certain bus stops? How does it get the clients uh, to the courthouse and other parts of downtown Oklahoma City? We okay. created our own bus stop. Yeah. <laughs> That, well, we were allowed to create them through the county and the city, but go ahead. Yeah, so we are, our shuttle is the Diversion Hub shuttle with a Diversion Hub staff member that operates it. Um, and we go basically eight to five, Monday through Friday. Um, when we first opened, it was on the fixed route between Oklahoma County Jail, Municipal Court, District Court, and the Diversion Hub. We've since expanded it a bit to address the need of our clients to um, remove transportation barriers for service-related appointments. So if a client needs to go to North Care um, or Red Rock, we're able to transport them there. We also utilize um, a private um, Lyft account if it is something that we need to get our client um, to somewhere else, but we can't utilize the shuttle. So if the barrier is transportation, um, we collaborate to make sure that we remove that so our client can be successful. And twice a year we buy the bus pass, embark yeah. bus passes at half price. We, I don't know how much we've bought, but I, I a lot. Yeah, we give. We're um, one of the biggest yeah. customers, I think. Thanks for being a great customer. Yeah. <laughs> Other welcome. questions. All righty. Fantastic. Again, Sue Ann and Megan, thank you so much for your dedication on this important issue for our community. You're you're not just changing lives, but you're changing the face of our community. So thank you so very much for your dedication. And I, I think the entire board really looks forward to working with you on this project. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll move to item nine on our agenda, comments by board, staff, or citizens. Do we have any citizens that have signed up? No, we do not, Madam Chairman. Great. Any additional comments by board? Okay, staff comments? No, ma'am. Okay. The only thing that I would say is that our next meeting is for October 1st. Um, on that, so we might be sure to carve out um, time in your schedules. And um, unless there's any other comments or questions for today, I will call on I'm sorry, Teresa, that was, we, we had some, some background noise and I caught like maybe every other word of, of everything you just said. Do you mind repeating? Oh, oh, oh sure. No problem. Thank you. I'm saying that um, our next meeting is Thursday, October 1st at 1030. And we have several presentations on various projects. So you might be sure and carve out if you can enough time in your schedule uh, so that you don't feel pressed. And if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I would uh, adjourn our meeting. Thank you, everybody. Apologize for my technical difficulties early. We'll, we'll get it together. Thanks all. Bye, everybody. <laughs>